Welcome to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information, visit us at compasslu.org. All right. We can open in Genesis chapter 1. We'll get there eventually. Good morning. Last week we talked about the gospel or the good news, and today we're going to talk about the bad news. <laughs> so, uh, Last week we talked about how the gospel that we're familiar with, the, the death, uh, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, uh, many of us sort of view that as the gospel. And what we saw last week was that uh, one of Jesus' initial 12, Peter, actually rejected that gospel when he first heard it. So he heard that and he rejected it. Uh, but thankfully that wasn't the only gospel that Jesus was preaching. He was also preaching this thing called the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that is what Jesus was preaching openly throughout his whole ministry. That's the, the gospel that they believed, the disciples believed, and they repented. And then they also preached it themselves. Um, so uh, with that, we saw in Acts 8, verse 12, just to recap a little bit, uh, that there are these two different gospels being preached after the resurrection. Uh, you still have the kingdom of God being preached, and then you have this new thing, the name of Jesus Christ, or it's sometimes just called uh, the things about Jesus elsewhere in the book of Acts. Um, and so those two things combined then become the gospel that Christians preach. So you have the kingdom of God, which was a message that Jesus proclaimed, that John proclaimed, uh, and all of his disciples proclaimed during his earthly ministry. And then that gets wedded to the things that happened in Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, after all those things take place. We also talked about how the Bible uh, simply defines the coming of the kingdom of God as God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And is that happening right now? No, it's not happening right now. So that's, that'll be completely true when Jesus returns and when the earth is restored. Uh, we also talked about three big patterns. We focused really, I think, on the first one last week. What God wanted in the beginning, he gets in the end. We're going to see a little bit more about that one uh, today as well. Um, the second one is that God taught throughout time principles of selflessness, sacrifice, and upside-down leadership with the intent for us to follow that example. Um, what we're going to see in more detail today is that that is what God charged the original humans with, and them casting that idea off, casting that aside, led to... Uh, one of the worst things that ever happened in human history, and I would argue that pretty much everything bad that's happened in human history since then has been because of that, because of that, uh, that attitude, that mindset of rejecting servant leadership and instead wanting to hoard resources and hoard uh, power and money and all that for yourself. Uh, then the third thing is the greatest desires of our heart, uh, justice, fairness, uh, peace, prosperity. Uh, these are all promised by God. Um, and then the world cannot offer any of these. We're going to talk that, about that more next week. So we'll get back to the good, good news on number three there next week. So we're going to continue today uh, pursuing the kingdom of God with all of our hearts uh, by looking at what is the bad news. And I think if we really do understand what happened in the garden, it'll really help us uh, understand why the gospel is good news. Um, so it always seems like this is how it goes, uh, at least in this life. You have good news and you have bad news. And for me, when I was 17, the good news was, Dad, everyone's okay. I'm okay. My friend's okay. The bad news, the side of the van was scraped up. <laughs> Thankfully, he took it pretty well. I appreciate my dad for not flying off the handle when I said that. So those of you who are parents of teenagers, God bless you. Hope you don't have to deal with that. So what is the bad news? The bad news is the first members of humanity, Adam and Eve, they decided to reject God's will. They decided to reject God's reign in their lives. And this impacted all of future humanity. It impacted the earth itself. And so understanding this will help us understand the gospel more. But when we approach the subject of uh, Adam and Eve and what happened in the garden, uh, you know, there are some, there's some weird imagery here. You've got like a talking snake. Uh, you've got this fruit, which many people uh, think of as an apple. So before we get into Genesis 1 and then progress through this record, I wanted to deal with some, some low-hanging fruit. And that is the common perspectives on what happened. 
Um, and so I wanted to, to show you a painting uh, from the year 1616 by Hendrik Goltheus called The Fall of Man. And believe it or not, this is like the most not R-rated uh, painting I could find about this from this period of time. So I apologize if I'm offending some sensibilities here, but this is literally the most PG-13 rated picture I could come up with uh, from, this, from this period of time. So what you have in the, going on this painting is you have Eve seductively eating an apple and looking like she's offering that apple to Adam. Uh, and I'm not honestly sure how we ended up with the apple as being the forbidden fruit, uh, but if the medieval and Renaissance world is like our world at all, I can imagine some medieval orange merchant wondering how he could boost business against the apple merchants he was competing with. And I think he's thinking to himself, how can I do this advertising campaign? What if I do a smear campaign against apples? Mm -hmm. So he asked his friend, who's an artist, to depict Eve holding an apple. And I think that might be where we get all this imagery of Adam and Eve. And, you know, so I think if you wouldn't want to do, uh, eat the forbidden fruit, right? So, you know, you hear people whispering. There's no, there's no internet. There's no memes. There's no, you know, like communicating this, but whispering, 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 whispering. So imagine, you know, you're an, app, you're an apple merchant and you're, you're in the town square and you're saying, you know, hey, come get your apples, get your apples here. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. And then you hear this voice coming from across the way saying, yeah, because you're making a deal with the devil. <laughs> That got out of hand pretty quickly. But anyway, that may not be what, what happened. But we ended up with this apple being the forbidden fruit for whatever reason. And I can tell you that that's very unlikely that an apple is actually the fruit that it's talking about here in Genesis. Uh, what about the talking snake? Uh, atheists and rejectors of Christianity will often say that a talking snake is just a ridiculous idea. In the painting, you sort of have the talking snake. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but it's sort of up in the upper middle. There's like this glowing serpent face over there. Anyway, uh, this is what Dan Kimball has to say in How Not to Read the Bible. He says, the word translated into English as serpent is the Hebrew word nakash. Hebrew scholars point out that this word is a triple entendre that just doesn't translate well into English. Like some of our English words, nakash can be a noun or a verb or an adjective. And here in Genesis, the author seems to be making some wordplay. As a noun, nakash means serpent. As a verb, it means to divine. So the nakash means the diviner. A diviner is someone who uh, reaches out to false gods, tries to um, get information from false gods. As an adjective, it means shining. The nakash means the shining one. Uh, so it gets people's attention, in other words. The shining does. So again, we don't need to be pushing too hard on a literal snake handing Eve a literal apple. That's not what's going on here and we can uh, understand that that's not what's going on. So with that in mind, let's look at Genesis chapter 1. And what I want to do is start by laying the foundation for what God's original intent was, uh, what he originally designed humanity to be. And I've, I've previewed this, but I want to show that it's really here in the text of Genesis 1 and 2. So in, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So um, there's, there's a, quite a bit going on here, um, and a lot, of, a lot of commentators have pointed out some very specific things uh, about these verses. And I just want to point out that um, ancient, the ancient Jewish or ancient Hebrew faith was very different from the other faiths in the world. 
Um, a lot of the other faiths, their, their creation stories that are similar to Genesis 1 in some respects, one of the big differences from those stories is the place of humanity in those stories. Uh, many of the stories, you think about, like, if you uh, know anything about Greek mythology or Egyptian mythology or these other ancient mythologies, uh, one of the recurring themes with, within Greek mythology and the, these other mythologies for sure is, is that humanity is sort of like... Um, like the, the animals to these gods. You know, it's like you've, you've got these animals and we're like, we're like well below the gods and the gods sort of toy with us, especially in Greek mythology. There's always gods who are like intervening and like messing around with human affairs and doing different things. Uh, but what, what this is talking about here in Genesis 1, the, the story, the picture that it is portraying is that God wants to partner with humanity. And that's a completely foreign thing in the ancient world. And so we've got a couple quotes. I, I mentioned this first one from last week about uh, having dominion is related to the word kingdom. And this is what the Bible Project says about that. They say God's plan was to share his world with humans and to have his reign and his rule brought about in the world through human beings. God reigns the world through humans. So again, we have a royal task here from the beginning. Our job was to, to rule um, through, God was to rule through us and to, we were to sort of mirror his will for the world. Um, in the understanding of the Bible commentary on Genesis, their entry on uh, Genesis 127 says this about the image of God uh, language. They say, it, the language image of God, conveys here that humans have the highest position in the created order. As God's representatives on earth, humans were invested by God with authority to subdue the earth and rule over the animals. So again here, the point is, is that we were meant to reign. Humanity was meant to reign. And uh, that was a good thing. And the, the whole point of that was we were to be servant leaders under God. We were to take what God's will was and then to... Uh, share that with the world. And there's also, uh, there, I will add this to Anna's, Anna and John Brown are watching at home today. They're not feeling 100%, but uh, Anna had a great presentation on the image of God that talks even in more detail about this that will be released uh, in the coming months on YouTube from the last UCA conference. Uh, in, in the ZIBBC, another commentary on Genesis, uh, their entry on one, Genesis 128 says, the characterization of humans as being in the image of God and the functions listed here reflect a royal, royal role for people since these descriptions would most frequently be applied to kings. They are given the responsibility of bringing order to their world. So, you know, this is the picture we're getting from Genesis 1. And again, it's so unique. It's so different from the other cultures of that time. And that is that humans were a vital part of God's plan. Uh, God was king over all, and we were kings underneath him. That was the original uh, plan. Uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 15. We're going to see even more about this idea that God had here in Genesis 2, 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So here we have uh, God giving humanity a specific way to rule. We've already seen that he's made uh, his humans kings and queens, and now he's giving them a sp very specific task, which we're going to unpack here in a second. But that, uh, that was to... Uh, Dress it and keep it. And he also gives them instruction on what uh, fruit is good to eat and what fruit is not. And there's, a, there's some, something going on here. We're going to unpack that here in a second. But I want to focus right now on uh, this dress it and keep it language because I've been suggesting this whole time that it's servant leadership that God had in mind. And what the scholars say is that the dress it and keep it language is uh, where that comes from. So here is uh, the understanding of the Bible commentary on uh, Genesis 2.15. It says, God assigned Adam to work and take care of, literally keep, shamar is the Hebrew word there, the garden. The meaning of shamar here is to take care of something, like a member of the flock. From the beginning, God charged man with responsible work. So 
Here is the work that God is entrusting with his first humans. They are kings and queens, but they are not kings and queens in the sense that we usually think of it. We usually think of a king or a queen as sitting on a throne and issuing a decree and being served by servants, right? That's how we picture kingship and queenship. But that's not what it's saying here. He put them in the garden to serve it, to dress it and to keep it. This is what uh, Victor Hamilton says in the New International Commentary on the Old Testament. He says, man is placed there to dress it and keep it. The word we have translated dress is abad, the normal Hebrew verb, verb meaning to serve. So again, the note is sounded that man is placed in the garden as servant. He is there not to be served, but to serve. The second verb, keep or tend, he, uh, Hebrew samar, carries a slightly different nuance. The basic meaning of this root is to exercise great care over, to the point, if necessary, of guarding. The garden is not something to be protected more than is something to be is something to be protected more than is something to be possessed. So again, we tend to view kingship as possession, as uh, over overruling or you know, sort of being in charge of something and, and putting requirements on something or being served ourselves. But that is not the intention that God had. He made Adam and Eve kings and queens, and he put them in the garden to exert servant leadership. That was the whole idea from the beginning. So with that in mind, understanding sort of that in place, that that's what God wanted, now when we think about Jesus' model for leadership, does that seem like a surprise or not? It's not as much of a surprise. It's still surprising, I think, because does this kind of servant leadership get modeled throughout human history very frequently? No. So it doesn't, it doesn't come up very frequently. Uh, but the idea is here that God, that is what God had in mind in the beginning, and then we screwed it up. <laughs> so that is the bad news. We screwed it up. So now we're going to get to the moment itself here in Genesis chapter 3, the moment we've all been waiting for. Genesis 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So this is the fall of man uh, as portrayed in the scripture. And, you know, I think uh, maybe something that we've heard a lot about and I'm not really going to comment too much on is notice how Eve changes what God said, right? I mean, we've, we've all heard things about that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here about that. What I want to focus in on is this idea of what is this knowledge of good and evil talking about? I think this is the key component, especially when we think about the gospel, the kingdom. What is going on here? So um, God later grants, later in chapter 3, he later says that the, one of the things that the serpent wasn't lying about, he was lying about some things, but there was one thing he wasn't lying about. And the one thing that he wasn't lying about is that this knowledge of good and evil would make Adam and Eve like God. Because God says later in Genesis 3, yep, they become like, like in us, knowing good and evil. So, so that was not a lie. That actually happened. So taking all this into account... Uh, what could the knowledge of good and evil be? Well, if we try to look at this literally, you know, just parsing it word for word, knowledge of good and evil, if we go back to the Hebrew language and try to hammer it out word for word, we're left with sort of two options. And the first option is uh, sort of like a conceptual knowledge of good and evil. Uh, the second option is an experi experiential knowledge of good and evil. And I'm going to show you that there are problems with both. So imagine that we're talking about a conceptual knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that would imply that God didn't tell them right from wrong, that they did not have a conceptual knowledge of good and evil before they sinned. So would it be fair in that case for God to punish them or for there to be consequences for that? No. And we also have the Bible saying very clearly that he told them not to whatever this is, knowledge, eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? So he told them right, he told them wrong. So they had a conceptual understanding of good and evil. So that, we can cross that off the list. 
Uh, now, what about experiential knowledge of good and evil? It is true that when they committed this sin, that they did experience evil for the first time. That is true. So what is the problem with that? Well, because later in Genesis 3, it says that God says, yeah, they're like one of us. They've got the knowledge of good and evil. So do we want to believe that God has experientially done evil before? No, that's not where we want to go with this either. So uh, we can sort of cross these two literal ideas off the list. Well, this means this has to be a figure of speech. That's what has to be going on here. Uh, so the answer is this phrase, the knowledge of good and evil is an idiom. And an idiom is just uh, the way that someone speaks in a specific uh, linguistic and cultural context. Uh, and here's another definition of it on our screen here. Um, so uh, one example of a modern idiom is uh, speak of the devil. Now, when we say speak of the devil, do we mean that the person that we're talking about is literally the devil? No. Now, maybe if you're that orange merchant way back in time, you might have wanted to use that. Oh, there's that apple merchant. Speak of the devil. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, we don't really mean that. So what does this idiom mean? The knowledge of good and evil, what does it mean? Um, now, I really do recommend uh, my friend John Truitt uh, has a whole class on the kingdom of God. It's available uh, for free on YouTube. Uh, I do recommend the class. If you want more information on what I'm about to explain, he handles it in session two, part two of his kingdom of God class. Um, I think there's also more information on the slide about the different verses he pulls from uh, 1 Kings 3, uh, 6 through 9 and verse 28, 2 Samuel 14, 17, uh, Jeremiah 42, 1 through 6, uh, Genesis 31, 22 through 42, and Deuteronomy 1, 19 through 39. Um, and so what he says about this, what John Truitt says about this, is that this idiom means uh, to have the right to make your own judgment about what is right and what is wrong. So again, God is the one who gave us initially morality and said, I am your king, and this is how you are to do things, and this is what is right, and this is what is wrong. And when Adam and Eve sinned, what they said is, we are rejecting your reign as king over us, and we think we can determine for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And John Truitt's not the only one who thinks this. I wanted to give this quote from the Understanding the Bible Commentary, the entry on this section of Scripture. It says, the third proposal, he's gone through two other proposals. The third proposal is that since good and evil often have a moral connotation, the issue at stake was moral knowledge. No may be interpreted as to have mastery over. Thus, humans were seeking to gain for themselves the prerogative of determining what was good and what was evil. So that is what I believe happened in the garden is, is humanity rejected God's reign. They rejected his view of what leadership and servant leadership should look like. And they said, we know what's better for us and for the world than you do, God. We're going to cast you off as our king and we're going to do things our own way. And as I like to say to my son when we're reading through Bible stories, was that a good decision or was that a bad decision? <laughs> It was a, and he always goes, that was a bad decision, Dan. <laughs> All right. So we're not going to read it, but if you read through the rest of Genesis 3, you'll find uh, the consequences of what that did. And there were consequences for humanity. Uh, we no longer had access to the tree of life, which means we were eventually going to die. Adam and Eve uh, lived long lives, but they eventually did die. Um, and there were consequences for the, for the earth. Um, and uh, the earth has never been the same. And we're going to talk about that more in detail next week about how uh, it says, for example, in Romans 8, that the world itself is groaning. It's waiting for its redemption from this fallen state. Um, and so there were consequences for us. There were consequences for the world. And I would say that there, has been, there have been ongoing consequences for the world. Because when we think about the model that God gave us in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it's a beautiful model. Us reigning as servants, servant leaders, and us bring out the best in the world and not, not causing things to go wrong because we're too greedy for power or whatever. So 
in light of that, I wanted to point out um, there are many examples of this throughout Scripture where people have pushed away servant leadership and have, have instead decided that they were going to be their own uh, rulers and they were going to do things the way that they thought. And one of them is in Judges 21. We don't have to go there. I'm just going to go here quickly on the slide. It says, in those days there were, there were no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And honestly, that's a pretty good summary of the whole Old Testament. <laughs> is that they pushed God away from being king. Um, and what's interesting about this judge's quote is that this was still during the time when God thought of himself as the king of Israel. Because Samuel later goes and says, he's, Samuel's the last judge, and they say to Samuel, hey, we want a king. And he goes to God, and God says, yep, do it. And he says, but they're rejecting you. And he says, yes, they are rejecting me as their king. Uh, but, but we can see the, the pattern gets built up before them. They're already rejecting him here in Judges as their king, and they're all doing what's right in their own eyes instead. Um, and that's where humanity largely is today. We think about the large movements in our modern society, uh, the way that people view the world uh, that's different from how the Bible describes it, and this is what it is. They don't want God as king. They're doing what's right in their own eyes. They think that they have the right to decide what is right and what is wrong. And that is the bad news. Now, I want to close here by giving some heart from how God started to rebuild the breach. If you want to turn with me, you can turn to Deuteronomy 6. So I think one of the most critical things uh, that can change our perspective about God, if we ever get into the spot where we view God as too authoritarian, too controlling, uh, too, I don't know, uh, too kingly. <laughs> I think a way for us to, to get out of that is to recognize that even, even in what we would consider to be a more controlling period of time, perhaps, some of us would think that, uh, during the time when, when God was giving the law, uh, that God did these things for humanity's benefit and specifically for Israel's benefit. All the commandments that he gave he gave for their benefit. Um, and so I think what gets me out of that mindset of, of oh, man, this is, too, this is too straight and narrow, God. I just want to be able to do this little thing. It's just one thing outside of what you said. I think to get me out of that, one of the things that helps me is recognizing that whatever God has told me to do, it is for my best. And I think about that as a parent of young kids. You know, sometimes they're like, Dad, I don't know why you're doing this. I'm like, hey, look. Do you trust me? I have what's best in mind for you. Just let me, let me tell you to do this this one little way, and then I'll explain it to you if I can. You know, I try to do the best I can to explain as much of that as possible, but I will tell them, look, I love you. I want what's best for you. Just please let me help you with this. That's how God's heart is. It's not, hey, you need to do this, or hey, you need to do that. It's, hey, this is what you've been designed to do. This is what I designed you to look like, and there's a reason for that, and you have to trust me that I know what's best for you. And here it is in Deuteronomy 6, verse 24, it says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. So God gave the children of Israel commandments encoded in what we call the law of Moses for their good always, to preserve them, to guide them, to keep them alive and thriving. And we can say the absolute same about the new covenant commandments that we are given in places like the Sermon on the Mount, in places like the epistles. We have to believe that God knows what's best for us. He knows the best way to do things. Um, and that's what he wants. He wants his best for us. And so that's why it's our responsibility in light of that to trust him and obey his commandments. So closing out today, God's original vision for humanity was to be kings and queens, but to be kings and queens in ways that we have never really seen kings and queens before, to be servant kings and servant queens. And the original humans, Adam and Eve, they did not live up to that. Instead, they rebelled and they decided to chart their own course. And here at Compass, we're not about charting our own course. <laughs> we're about following Jesus. So because of that, because of Adam and Eve's rebellion, humans have generally said, I can choose right and wrong for myself. I don't need God. But here's the good news. 
The good news is God has made a path for us to return under his reign, to come under his reign and to come under the lordship of his son, Jesus. And with that, we can pass from this death that our forefathers uh, consigned us to, to the life that God promises us through Christ. And in that, we can experience all the goodness that God has in store for us, both now and throughout all of eternity in his kingdom. Will you pray with me? Father, we're just so thankful for your vision for humanity, for how you designed us to follow you, for us, for us to uh, to, uh, for us to reign, God, what a great responsibility, what a great privilege that is and continues to be. And Lord, we, we have seen today how your initial, uh, the humans that you initially created, Adam and Eve, how they messed this up. And they decided to reject you, Lord. And we've seen that they've decided to uh, determine what was right and wrong for themselves. And God, we, we choose today that we are not going to make that decision. We are going to return to your reign. We are going to uh, come under you and trust you and believe that you know what is right for us. You know what is best for us, God. So we're just thankful that you've given us that opportunity, that you sent your son Jesus, that his life emulated the life that you wished Adam and Eve had lived. His example of leadership, his example of service, how dynamic it was, how powerful it was, and it doesn't look, God, like the world around us. We see that, and that is attractive to us. It gets our attention. So, Father, we're just so thankful today that we have uh, the example of your son, that we have his lordship in our lives, even today as we anticipate his coming whenever you send him, Father. So we just lift all this to you today and ask you to protect us and keep us safe and to keep us on the path that you've laid out for us. Through your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information on how we are striving to follow Jesus together here in Louisville, Kentucky, check out our website, compasslu.org, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and view additional resources.